Our end of year awards shows continue, now focusing on the best CPUs for 2017. This includes awards for biggest upset, best overall value, budget gaming, and biggest disappointment, along with a couple of others. 2017 has given us an onslaught of CPU releases, more than any year in recent memory, and deserves a send-off to recap the battles in each category. Each of the CPUs we're discussing today will have a link in the description below if you want to buy it, and then we'll also have the reviews with them if you need to catch up on what we said about them when they first launched. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB Closed Loop Liquid Cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus 3120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake Rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 Gen Azetec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. For the CPU awards, we have one CPU for each major category from the low end to the high end. And because this is a CPU recap, it's important here to note that as you look through older coverage, we'll link each review in the description below for each of its respective CPUs. As you look through the old coverage, keep in mind that Windows updates, driver updates, things like that, have impact on the results. So you'll probably want to just look at our most recent CPU reviews, which would be the Coffee Lake 8400 and 8700K ones, to get the charts that include the most up-to-date numbers possible. That stated, uh, again, each one will be linked in the description below if you want to buy it, and then we also have the respective reviews with them. So let's get into it. Our first award, Best Overall Value, teetered between the R5 1600 and i5 8400, but the R5 1600 ultimately wins the award. Back when the R5 CPUs launched, we declared the KB Lake i5s as approaching obsolescence and awarded the R5 1600X with our Editor's Choice Award. The 8th gen launch strongly challenged the R5s in many instances, but lacking B and H motherboards and a paper supply further fuels the R5 1600's receipt of our best overall value assignment. The rest of the fuel stems from competitive performance across the whole suite of tests, including production and reasonably competitive performance in gaming. The CPU manages to keep up within a couple percentage points of the i5-8400 in most games tested, aside from a select few titles that just don't play well with Ryzen, like Destiny 2 and GTA 5. If those are going to be your years-long obsessions, maybe look at other options, but for all-around performance, the R5-1600 offers overclocking headroom upwards of 3.9 to 4.1 GHz, has plenty of affordable motherboard options, and maintains a strong lead in rendering workloads. Of course, comparatively few users are going to leverage the full production capabilities of the R5 CPUs versus those who post multitasking capabilities, but the R5 CPUs give mobility for exploring beginner professional workloads, which we think is important for this class of CPU. It's the first CPU of its kind that lets you get into these types of workloads without a major upfront investment. And that's the main reason we like this CPU. It's an option that gives excellent beginner avenues to learn overclocking, ones which yield very direct gains in performance, while also offering beginner to intermediate options for workstation tasks. Gaming performance never chart tops in our tests, but it's also not that far behind the 8400, and even closer when accounting for 2666 MHz memory with a hypothetical B or H motherboard. The R5-1600 receives our highest praise for its whole value proposition, and we find the CPU to be a genuinely exciting gateway for inbound enthusiasts. Ignoring the value side of things, we see Intel's i7-8700K as the most well-rounded CPU launch in the sub-$500 class for the year. The 8700K and its Z370 platform have wide-reaching memory support, high overclocking potential even on our potato chip, relatively. It also pushes chart-topping performance in gaming workloads, Short of going for Threadripper or Skylake X, the 8700K is able to easily keep up with 4 GHz R7 CPUs, and Intel's usage of the HCC TIM on the 8700K also significantly helped with its thermals. This makes the CPU completely reasonable to operate even without a DLID, though DLIDing does still grant tremendous gains to aid in power leakage reduction, something we showed in our review. Overall, the 8700K is a strong showing from Intel, and it was the company's return to form after years of small increments. Intel's move to 6-core 12 thread is just as important for AMD as it is for Intel, as the transition will help secure development focus on multi-core optimization for years to come. The 8700K also improves in key areas where Intel has fallen behind, like the improvement to thermal performance by way of die area increases and HCC TIM, and the CPU also exhibits strong performance in H.264 livestream encoding an area where the previous 7700K was heavily outmatched by the 1700. It's just a matter of whether you can find one in stock, 
unfortunately, and whether that retailer is selling them close to the suggested price of roughly $370. Maybe you don't care much about gaming though and need something that's a bit more money efficient. The R7-1700 takes our award for best value for production as a CPU. Since its launch, we have held the R7-1700 high over the heads of its 1700X and 1800X neighbors, and time and again, it demonstrates how easily the R7-1700 is overclocked to achieve similar, if not better, performance to the more expensive alternatives. With pricing regularly seeing sales as low as $270, but commonly sitting around $300, the R7-1700 easily takes this award. We see the 1700 as a good fit for small business or hobbyist and freelance workstation users, people who might do things like 3D animation or modeling, for instance, or other render-centric tasks that can benefit from core count. The R7-1700 stands alone in its value offering for such users, and it's AMD's best launch in the R7 family. It's power efficient, has overclocking headroom, and handles multi-threaded render workloads readily, and it's also affordable. The next award is for the best budget gaming CPU. We're looking at ultra budget here, as in cheapest possible gaming build that still remains reasonably scalable, and this goes to the Intel Pentium G4560. The G4560 has lived a troubled life thus far. Like the G3258 before it, the 4560 saw instant success in low budget markets and quickly sold out. The CPU also shot up in price, has gone through supply shortages, and up until recently has been difficult to get a hold of. Finally though, the 4560 is readily available, and it's still slightly higher than desired at a price of $70 to $80, but one of the best options for a dirt cheap desktop gaming PC. The CPU performs reasonably in most games we've tested. We even performed a G4560 GPU bottlenecking test earlier this year, finding that the CPU didn't significantly choke on GPUs until entering into the GTX 1070 territory. The G4560 is well suited for RX 570s and 470s, GTX 1050Ti's, and even GTX 1060s, but now, for purposes of balancing system cost, we'd recommend staying in the sub $200 GPU price range. That said, you've got room to go a little beyond that. Not much, but it's there, and for the most part, the CPU does well in games. There are, as always, a couple that it struggles with, just make sure you check our original benchmarks to figure out if those apply to you. For when cost is the heaviest restriction and $120 i3 CPUs aren't an option, the G4560 remains competitive. Our next award goes to the 7960X for being the most fun to overclock this year. It required a lot of prep work, delitting and some conduct to not set the stage, with big radiators and high-end fans doing the rest. This award is shared equally, I suppose, by the ASUS X299 Rampage board for its limitless, nigh-overwhelming overclocking options and sub-options, and a direct fan on the VRM, a D-lid later, and we were able to push the 7960X into the range of 4.7 GHz with just a 360mm radiator. We were nearly stable at 4.8 too, but some further tuning may have achieved it. Pushing 4.7 on a 16-core CPU in what is an actual potential user scenario is impressive to say the least. It's a 500 watt power consumption doing so, of course, so it's impractical for long-term use, but it's a fun day of testing and it reinvigorates the enthusiast spirit of it. If you're looking for overclocking, we do like the 7960X for that task and it is a good CPU as well. Just a bit expensive when you look at our next category. And that one is the biggest upset of 2017. This one goes to the Threadripper CPU. Before Threadripper, we thought this would go to the R5s, but the Threadripper and X299 shipments completely changed the HEDT landscape. Threadripper's launch upset the high-end market in a way that has had wide-reaching impact. At its price, the $1,000 Threadripper 1950X has some of the best performance in heavily multi-threaded workloads, and is challenged most heavily by significantly more expensive Intel CPUs. Additional PCIe lanes become highly valuable in use cases that are left otherwise unserved at this price point, and Threadripper manages to serve both traditional HEDT and fringe HEDT users exceptionally well. For this category, we do favor the 1950X. Oh, and before someone begins typing a gigantic tirade, please note that the words biggest upset aren't a bad thing. We're saying that it upset the incumbent in the market, not that it's upsetting. That goes to the next category. And that's biggest disappointment. Across all the products launched this year, and there were many contenders for biggest disappointment, the absolute hands-down winner of this dunce cap is the KB Lake X CPU line. We were clear in our dislike of this lineup when it launched. Some of you took issue with our quote, disrespectful tossing of the 7740X CPU, 
But that's a minor grievance when compared to how Intel tossed KB Lake X users aside instantly with Coffee Lake. Mere months after its nearly pointless launch, the languishing KB Lake X CPU argument became more belabored in the face of Coffee Lake. The KB Lake X launch is the single biggest CPU disappointment since Bulldozer. It's not horribly performing, but it also has no wide reaching mainstream defense to its existence. This is not a matter of performance, it's a matter of why it exists. The product line was a bullshit segmentation attempt from the start, and it has remained such through the rest of the year. The final award is for worst trend. We're using this one to call out commenters. AMD and Intel have both put out some good CPUs this year, and when we look at head-to-head -head matchups at the same price, there tend to be victories on both sides of the fence. The worst trend award goes to everyone who felt it necessary to forge new truths, also known as talking out of your ass or lying. And this is for the people who felt it necessary to defend their preferred CPU in every single use case, whether or not the CPU made sense in that use case. Newsflash, no one CPU will be the best at everything. And when something like Ryzen or Coffee Lake are as good as they are at their respective strengths, there is no need to make things up. No, objectively speaking, an R7-1700 is not, quote, smoother in gaming than a modern i7. And no, an 8700K does not invalidate the 1700 as a world-class production CPU. It's possible for both of these CPUs to coexist and dominate different markets. Fortunately, they're both fairly versatile, so they have some crossover between them where you can even do things like gaming on one or production on the other. So this is an instance where we don't need to go around posting comments that straight make things up because seriously, the CPUs are good enough on their own. They don't need your help. Just stick to the actual reality of them. So separately, with the advent of the six core Intel CPUs and the Ryzen push further on eight cores, six cores, and so on, we'd like to remind everyone that Chrome and Discord don't count as multitasking. Uh, that's not really what people mean when they talk about multitasking. Oh, and before anyone says, but my cores, we're not saying it's a bad thing for the industry to move in this direction. We're just saying seek to understand what the change actually does for you rather than making things up. So that's all for this one. We've got some good CPUs on the list and we've got some great comments on the list. Thank you for a year of those. And uh, we hope you appreciated a year of CPU reviews. I think we're done with the reviews of CPUs for the end of the year though, hopefully, but there will be more to come sometime around or after CES. So stay tuned for all that. You can subscribe for more as always. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus helps out directly. Links to the products and the reviews in the description below. And I'll see you all next time.